basketball is played as many different ways as probably there are people who coach the game. During the next two hours, we're going to try and take you through three phases of basketball at Indiana University. All of these three phases, defensive play, offensive play against man-to-man -man defense, and offensive play against the zone defense, will incorporate the basic fundamental approaches that we use in each area. Basketball at Indiana is not a complex thing in terms of the number of different things that we do. We really play basically one defense. We have one basic approach to both man-to-man -man defense in our attack of it and the same against zone defense and our attack of it. Yet within this simple approach, there are some complexities. What we're going to go through will be all of the basic fundamental drills that we use in the development of offensive and defensive play. Sometimes I tell my players that what we have is complicated simplicity. There are really two schools of thought, I think, in basketball coaching. One, surprise and change, using a variety of offensive and or defensive approaches to any one game situation. The second, simplicity and execution. Ours is obviously from the latter school. Simplicity and execution, I think, is the way that we can go and best teach what we want. I don't think that you have time to teach a variety of things and teach them well. I think you've got to teach a few things about the game of basketball to your players and teach them as well as you possibly can. Hey, you realize you've got four other guys out here playing, don't you? I mean, you've got to learn to use your imagination. Imagination is one of the most important things a basketball player can have. If you don't have an imagination, then it's very tough to recognize and anticipate. You guys are three on three right here. Where do the other four guys go? Let's go. My very close friend, Pete Newell, who I think is perhaps the greatest coach we've ever seen, sums up basketball simply by saying you have to get more shots than they do and you have to get better shots than they get. That talks about both your offensive play and your defensive play. When I think about an approach to coaching basketball, I always think about the old Western movie Shane, starring Alan Ladd and Gene Arthur, Van Heflin and Brandon DeWilda. And some of you are not going to remember a couple of these names. But in a scene from Shane, Alan Ladd as the gunfighter is in a corral with Brandon DeWilda, the young son of the Homesteader family, and he has his gun, and Brandon DeWilda asked Shane, Shane, why do you only use one gun? And Shane looked at him and said, son, one's all you need if you know how to use it. And that's the way I feel about basketball. If what you do is executed properly, it can be simple, and that's all you need to use. Later, in that same movie, the little boy asked Shane, well, why do you wear your gun high on your hip when other people wear it here or there or wherever? And Shane said, because I found that wearing it here is as good as any and better than most. I think that by keeping things as absolutely simple as we possibly can, we have a much better chance of executing the basic fundamentals of the game. Danny, Danny, before you threw it away, you walked with it here. Bang, bang, dribble, bad pass. You know, there are so many things that you guys do that are wrong that you can correct yourself if you just concentrate. Pete Newell has further stated that basketball is perhaps the most overcoached and undertaught game in the world. Teaching the game is, I think, of paramount importance. We don't give the kids offenses and defenses. What we try to do is teach them, from a defensive standpoint, how to use their feet, how to coordinate the use of their hands with good footwork, how to understand positioning, how to anticipate what's going to happen, how to recognize what's going to happen, how to communicate and help with one another. Offensively, we're trying to teach cutting and screening, handling the basketball without making mistakes, getting 
good shots. I think that as a coach, your primary responsibility is just as a teacher in a classroom. You're teaching basic fundamentals of your subject, which is basketball. You've got to teach kids how to play. You don't give them things to use and think that an offense is going to score or a defense is going to prevent people from scoring. That just doesn't happen. People play the game. People either score or they don't score. People prevent the other team from scoring or they allow the other team to score. And these people, your players, have got to be taught by you how to play the game. See, what'd you do? Why? That's a, you see, it's no more difficult, Winston, to open up and see the ball than it is to turn your back and not see the ball. So why not do the right thing? Now let's talk for a moment about the basic teaching method that's got to go into successful practice. This is the part-whole method of teaching. You've got to break everything you do into parts. Don't care what you do defensively, man-to-man, -man, zone, press, you've got to break it down into the parts that make the whole successful. Those parts become then your defensive drills and you put them together to build your team defense. You do the exact same thing with your offense. You take the parts of your offense, the individual cuts, the individual screens, you work on them in drill form, and then you put it together into the whole. The part-whole method has got to be followed, in my opinion, every day of practice. We've got to break our offense and our defense down into parts, and then we put the whole together. We found several years ago it was necessary to set up a little drill for our players where they work at catching the ball, making a fake, dribbling it, and coming to a stop without traveling. I think the most common error in basketball relative to turning it over is the travel violation. This is a simple drill where players work in pairs, trying to prevent the walk, trying to make good cuts, catch the ball, make good starts on the dribble without shuffling the feet. Anytime there's a problem with something in basketball, I think it's incumbent upon you as a coach to develop a drill situation that will work to combat the problem that you have, that will work to straighten out the deficiencies that you have. You know, we're the teachers and the kids are the students. And if we haven't taught them exactly what to do, then we can't expect them to do those things that they haven't been taught. I think it's as simple as that. And that's what the practice floor is all about. We want to force the postman to pick up the driver, and once the dribble has been stopped, we want him to have to recover to the shooter. We also have an offensive play here where the pass has to be made, and we've got to get the shot against pressure. I think any time, as I've said on several occasions, that you set up a drill that doesn't have offensive and defensive implications, it's a poorly thought out drill. Repetition, I think, is one of the most important keys in teaching success. We've got to be repetitive in our teaching. We've got to set up situations where we continually go over those things that are most important to our success, both offensively and defensively. We don't just repeat within today's practice structure, but we are repetitive in our thinking and in our organization day after day in both our offensive and our defensive approaches. All right, here's a good example of our side-to-side -side contesting drill. We contest him, we front him in the post, we contest on the other side. He makes a little bit of a lunge for the ball, which we don't want. He's got to stay in position. Take it again, take it again. Make him work, make him work, Winston! Front the post, contest on both sides. Bring him back, bring him back! As we're going through our drills, you'll notice that everything we do has the same rotation. We go from offense to defense to the end of the line. I think it's important that the defensive man is a little tired, the offensive man is fresh, so we get the defensive man in a position where he's got to work against the fresher guy. Give the advantage to the offense in every single way you can in practice to develop the defense. One of the real keys, perhaps the most important key in my mind in successful coaching is being able to emphasize those points that are most pertinent to what you're doing 
in all phases of play. Everything you do in one drill has to be a carryover to another drill. If you're talking to players about pass fake in one drill, then you've got to make certain that you emphasize pass fake in every drill that you're running and everything that you're doing. Too many times I think coaches make a big mistake by working on point one in drill A and then they go on to point B where they're going to work on point two or drill B where they're going to work on point two and they fail to emphasize point one. I think one of the real keys in coaching basketball is to be able to constantly emphasize points going from one drill to another. That what we work on today, we continue to work on tomorrow. That what we work on in one drill, we're going to work on in the next drill. Two on two is a basic guard pickup for us. We pick up at midcourt. We try to work two on two situation. So our guards have got to get used to pressuring the basketball, to contesting the other guard. We give the offense the entire half court to operate in, which makes it very, very difficult on the defense. We don't allow any switching. They've got to stay with the man that they've been assigned to play or that they pick up at midcourt. I think you can see that we try to go from one sequence to another as quickly as we possibly can. I think a key to a good practice situation is getting the players to work so they're going very quickly from one sequence to another. We let them stand around, we let them walk. I think it just destroys the practice. As we go down the floor, we're going to be in a weave pattern. As we come back, it'll be straight lines. Jumpers, jumpers, let's go! Mike. We've talked about repetition being a key to teaching success. And I'm a firm believer in this, as I've already mentioned. Yet in a practice situation, when mistakes are committed, I think they have to be corrected right away. And I think there's a definite way to correct mistakes, and that's as quickly as possible. I believe that we as coaches have a tendency to talk too much in practice and work too little. I think we get into many situations where we are explaining mistakes, where we are going over something verbally at the expense of working on it and getting actual repetition into the particular skill, whatever that might be. Sometimes we have the cutter move out wider and the screener come in tighter to get the proper angle set in what we want. Get the right angle now, Uwe. The right angle. Come. Time your cut, Daryl. Don't, don't drift in there like you're looking at Uwe. Wait till Uwe's coming, then come off of him hard. You got way in too deep that time. We want you coming off toward the ball, not away from the ball now. Now, set him up. Now you, good, very good. Excellent, all right, look what we got. Because you made a good move off that, very good. Spread it out, spread it out. So you got a three-man front. Wider, Tracy, wider. Get back, Chuck, top of the key. All right, let's go. We'll go from one man dribbling against a two-man gap to two players working against three people. Now we've set up two gaps that we want to go into. We're trying to get our offensive people to penetrate those gaps. Split the, hold it, hold it. Go all the way through the gap if you can. Take the ball right to the bucket. You're trying to get through those gaps. You're not just trying to get into them, you're trying to get through the gap, all the way to the bucket. Let's go. Look for the step up shot. Come on defense, you've got to shut him off. Hold it, hold it, hold it. Steve, the ball has to come to the middle of the court before you can bring it back where you got it from. Anytime you're playing the side of his own offense and the ball comes back to you, it's got to touch the middle of the floor before you can bring it back to that same side. That's it, that's it. Get it reversed, get it reversed, good. While we have to correct mistakes and correct them immediately, I think as a coach you've got to do it very quickly or you must take that player out of the situation and continue the drill and correct his mistake on the sideline. Now, before we get into the actual work, the things that we do to develop individual and team defensive play from a basic fundamental standpoint, 
let's just spend a moment talking about practice structure. More than anything else, I'm a strong believer in the structure of your practice being the singularly most determining reason for your success or lack of success as a coach. First of all, I think your practice has got to be set up in such a way that you make absolute maximum use of facilities available. Baskets, space, balls, whatever you've got. I've coached in situations where I've been the only guy on the floor or I've had four or five assistants. If I'm the only guy out there, I work right out of the middle of the court. I'm going to make sure that I can see in every direction, that I've got everything under control. If I have assistance, then I move around the floor, going from one group to another. I never have more than one extra player in any given drill situation. In other words, if I have a one-on-one -on -one situation, there will only be three people involved in that drill. If I have a two-on-two -two situation, I would only have six people involved in the drill, just one more than enough to do the drill. In our 11-man break drill, we fill 11 spots. Three offensive spots, two defensive spots, two outlets, and at the other end of the court, we have two outlets and two defensive spots. When the ball is taken, all five people, the three offensive players and the two defensive players, go after the rebound. Whoever gets it joins with the two outlet men at that end of the court and we take the ball three on two to the other end. This is a continuous drill that involves everything we have to do in terms of offensive transition and the tail end of our defense against the break. We get different people in the middle who have to work at handling the ball. We're filling the lanes on the break, getting the ball out and down. We get our people that can handle the ball best in the middle. Our people that aren't as adept at handling the ball go to the lane sides of the floor. One of our combination drills is to set five offensive players against four defensive players. In this way, we give the advantage to the offense numerically. The defense has to cover five people with four. We try to get into the next possession just as quickly as possible. I think this is an imperative part of practice. You've got to make sure that your kids are hustling and moving as quickly as they can through everything that they do. Five on four puts the offense in an obvious advantageous situation. We think any time that we can set up a situation where the defense is at a numerical disadvantage or the offense has an advantage because of the use of two basketballs, we're putting the kind of pressure on our defense that's going to help us develop. If four people can learn to contain five, then we think when we get into a game situation, we're going to profit from it tremendously. It's in keeping with our idea that practice has got to be more difficult for our players than games. Certainly trying to contain five people in practice with four defensive men is going to be a lot tougher than trying to play five on five in a game situation. We rotate either one player in or we rotate the two players that I simply consider one more than enough to do the drill in and rotate the other group out. Our rotation in every drill that we do is always from offense to defense, out, and then back in, offense, defense, and out. Let's see how we'd put this into effect in practice. In this setup, we simply want to show how we rotate in all of our drills. We're going to go from offense to defense and out with the new man coming in on offense. We don't change positions in drills. We never leave it up to the players as to how they're going to rotate. Every one of our drills has the exact same rotation. I think a consistency in everything that you do is necessary. This is our driving line drill. The offensive man makes his move at the basket. We rotate it with the offense going to defense, a new man stepping in, and the defensive man ready to come in on the next move. I think that you can do a, a real service to your practice structure by utilizing managers in positions where they handle the basketball or make passes or catch it or set screens or apply some kind of defensive pressure. I think over the years here at Indiana, our managers have had a tremendous effect on the development of our basketball team because of the way in which we have utilized them in practice situations. 
This is an excellent way to put everything together that you're working on in both aspects of your defense by giving an advantage to the offense. The advantage here is the room in which the offense has to operate. They've got two people working in an entire court. The coach is handling the basketball or managers handling the basketball can threaten to make the penetrating drive to the basket. The defense has to react to that by shutting off that drive. At any time that they feel a necessity to do so, the offensive players can return the ball to one of the two feeders on top and we can resume our movement inside. Everything you're doing in practice has got to be geared to making your team quicker mentally and physically. Hold it, hold it, hold it. Tracy, that's just what I'm saying. You made no look to block out. Tracy, you don't think at all. You made no look to block out. You had two guys over there. All you did was look at the shot. Winston goes right by you, gets a rebound. You didn't look over here to see who I can go block out. You know, this game, playing this game is a matter of thinking better than the other guy does. You know, it's not a matter of you being bigger or quicker or stronger or anything. It's a matter of you thinking better. I think we can do a lot more with mental quickness than we can with physical quickness. If you are moving your players very quickly from one thing to another, you're not giving them time to rest and walk on to the next drill and then explain what it is, you're going to have a team that reacts quicker to situations in a game. If you're a sloppy guy in terms of how quickly you get your players going from one thing to another, how long it takes them to get from one thing to another determines, I think, how quickly they're going to react in a game situation. We try and go as rapidly as we can from one thing to another. And in this regard, we set up practice so that we never work on an individual drill for longer than five minutes. Anytime we're working on a single fundamental aspect of the game, we'll work on it for five minutes and then we go to something else. We don't work on team things for longer than 10 minutes. If we're going to work on zone offense, We'll only work on it for 10 minutes. If I feel we need 30 minutes of work in a given practice on a zone offense, we'll just work 10 minutes and then go on to something else and then come back. We play four on four with an open post man, nobody guarding him. Puts a great pressure on the defense. The offense has an automatic release in the middle of the floor. There are all kinds of back cut, down screen, back screen possibilities. The offense has got to react to the pass to the postman by getting in to help out on the postman to put pressure on the postman. And at the same time, we're playing the normal parts of our four on four defense, both ball side and help side. In everything that we're doing, we're trying to get from one possession to the other just as quickly as possible. We're very demanding in this regard because I think that the players have got to be able to react quickly to situations. We have got to make them as mentally quick as we possibly can. It's always been my contention that you can do a lot more to develop mental quickness than you can physical quickness. Physical quickness, for the most part, is something that you either have or don't have. But the development of mental quickness is something that we can work on every day at practice. And if we can become quicker mentally, if we can recognize things quicker, anticipate quicker, then we automatically become quicker physically. In this demonstration, we're going to give the players 20 seconds and see which player gets the most baskets in 20 seconds. Now, they have competition against one another and they also have the pressure of time, the limit of 20 seconds. Ready, start. They've got to concentrate on the basket. I think it's very good that we have more than one person shooting. So there is a little bit of confusion in the game, that there are some distractions that make them work hard at concentration. We'll increase this in just a moment. Stop. The next shooting drill involves two people on a basketball. This is a drill that we throw in at various times during the course of any practice. I'll just call out, pair up, shoot to 10. Immediately, the players grab partners, they get to the nearest basket, and we're going to shoot to 10. For the sake of demonstration, we'll only go to four. Ready? Start. Player takes the shot, gets his own rebound, throws it back to his partner. Again, there's an amount of concentration and discipline involved relative to chasing the ball down, getting the pass back to the guy so he can step right up and take the shot. Trying to develop quickness is extremely important to us in this drill, as is the case with any of our shooting drills, because we've got to develop players who not only can get the ball in the hole, 
but can do it under pressure and can do it as quickly as possible. The pressures of game play have got to be a part of every shooting drill that we use. Stop. I also think it's imperative that any time you have a five-on-five five possession in practice, you are converting the end of the possession, whether it be a defensive rebound, a turnover, or an offensive basket, you are converting it to the other end of the floor. As coaches, we think an awful lot of offensive play and defensive play. But I think that area in the middle, conversion, many people call it transition, conversion to offense or conversion to defense is going to be the final determining factor in what kind of a team you have. If your team can get down the floor defensively without giving up easy scores, and if your team can get down the floor offensively and eventually get a good shot, then you're going to be a pretty tough team to beat. In every blockout drill that we use, every sequence, we want our players to take the ball on an outlet, either through the dribble, and there are some players that we allow to use the dribble on the outlet, and some that we don't. Let's get the outlet! Get the ball out of there! If a player is one of those that we allow to dribble the ball out of there, he can do so. If it's a player that we have make the outlet pass rather than using the dribble, he's going to make the pass every time he gets the defensive rebound. My whole idea in getting the ball out of there is simply to get away from the board with the basketball. I don't want the ball thrown away in attempting to get a quick outlet from the defensive board. I'd rather get away a couple seconds slower and still have the basketball. Conversion is so important to what we do in a basketball game, I think more important than either offense or defense. We set up a five-on-five -five situation where we stay at one end of the court. Each time a coach hollers change, the offensive man with the ball drops it right where it is. The defense has to change the offense immediately, trying to score at the same basket. The offense makes the conversion to the, to the defense, but must pick up somebody other than the man that is presently guarding each of them. We, We set up a five-on-five five situation where the offense is looking to score. If at any time one of the coaches hollers change, the offensive man with the ball immediately drops it. The defense converts to offense at the same end of the court, trying to score right away. The offense converting to defense must do so by picking up a player other than the one guarding each of them. We think this really helps us with our conversion instead of going from end to end and utilizing the time involved in that conversion. All of our conversion has to take place right at the same basket. Our players have to be very much aware of what's happening. They have to be able to recognize where the ball is. They have to communicate and pick up players immediately or there's going to be a score made. Practice structure is going to determine how your players are going to go about playing the game. And I think practice structure is the thing that you've got to do an extremely good job with in the development process that's going to lead to your being able to compete successfully in game situations. We set up a two-on-two -two guard situation with three managers across the court. We don't allow any switching, and this makes our guards play against everything that can be done to them in a ball game. There can be splits, inside cuts, shuffle cuts, down screens, back doors, back cuts. The offense has five people out here, three of whom aren't being guarded. Our two defensive guards have got to handle the whole situation without any help except that which they can give to each other. The only two people that are going to shoot the ball or try to score are the two that they're guarding. But this puts a tremendous amount of pressure on our defensive players because of all that's available to the two guards offensively in view of the fact that they're the only people being guarded. They have three automatic releases for their passes, they have three guys that can feed for them, and three guys that can screen for them. We found over the years that this has probably been the singularly most effective developmental series that we use with our guards. I think that's probably because it puts everything together that we work on in our individual drills defensively. Playing without the dribble is essential to the development of our offense. Our players have got to be able to cut and pass and screen to get the shot without putting the ball on the floor. 
then when we utilize the dribble with what we're doing offensively, I think it becomes a very effective weapon. Our players know that we don't have to put the ball on the floor a lot, that we can get by with good cutting and screening, and we're going to get good shots. Then the use of the dribble, as I just mentioned, becomes something that's very effective instead of a thing that we just use as a crutch. Practice must be set up so that your players are constantly in drill situations or in team situations that are more difficult than they're going to encounter in actual game situations. You can do this by giving an advantage to the defense. Five offensive players uh, versus six defensive players in attacking the press. Give an advantage to the offense. Five offensive players versus four defensive players in a half court situation. Two basketballs can often be used in defensive drills to give the offense an advantage, put the defensive player in a position that will be much more difficult than any he will encounter in a game situation. Everything that we do in practice, we try to make tougher than our players are going to have uh, to face in game situations. In doing this, we think that our kids are going to be able to go into a game with the confidence that they've worked on things in practice, they've been required to do things in practice that are going to be more difficult than they will encounter in the game. In that way, I think we can get the same level of competition, uh, the same level of efficiency in game play that we get in practice play, and this is often a very difficult thing to do. All right, now we're going to change. We got four things that we're going to do, five on four in the color. I'll call it out. Six on four, five-man change, or four on four in an open postman. I'll call out what I want. Five on four, red ball. Now we're going to utilize four different things. Five on four, six on four, five-man change, and four on four in an open post, man. Six on four, white ball. I'll call out the possession, and we'll go quickly from one thing to another. Here we're in six on four. We have to stop the manager's drive. We got to recover to the pass back out. Five on four, white ball. I expect the players to react very quickly to whatever I call out on the possession. I think this is the kind of thing that enables us to change from one defense to another. Four on four, open post, red ball. The players don't know whether they're going to be on offense or defense until I call out the possession. They don't know how many people are going to have to be out here. Four on four, open post, white ball, let's go. When I call out the possession, we go right into it. It's up to the defense to react to what I call. Five man change, let's go, white. Move it, move it, let's go. Change. Pick up, pick up, pick up. Back on top, back on top. Five man change, red ball. Spread it out, spread it out, let's go. All right, Tracy, don't call right there. Whose man should that be, yours or Todd's? Then get to him, tell Todd to take Danny. Change. Just drop the ball, hold it, hold it. Drop the ball, Danny, drop the ball. Don't throw it out of bounds, don't put it in the stands, just drop the basketball where it is. Red ball, five man change, let's go. By changing from one drill set up to another, I think we put a great pressure on the players to recognize what we're doing to quickly go from one thing to another. Change! What do we got, what do we got? Change! Change! You're not picking up the ball, Chuck. Five on four, red ball. Get right into it, Steve. As soon as I call out a possession, I want the offense to get right into it. Five on four, white ball. By recognizing and getting right into what we're doing, I think we're really working at the game of basketball. The game changes so much from one end to the other. Four on four, white ball, open post, man that we've got to do things in practice that enable us to get into a ball game and change with the tempos, changes of the game. If we anticipate what's happening, four on four, red ball, open post. If we can get to the point where we anticipate what's happening, we recognize the dangerous situations, then we're going to be able to become a better basketball team. Five on four, wait! We as coaches have to create the difficult situations for our players. We have to set up a, a, a period where our players are being required to think what they're in, where they're being required to react. Six on four, red ball. 
If we don't force our players to react to things, if we don't put them in tough situations, then that's our fault that they can't react to them in a ball game. Uh, five on four, Red. Free throws. There are three basic principles to good defensive play. These basic principles are number one, pressure on the basketball. There has to be pressure on the basketball in all circumstances, when it's being dribbled, passed, shot, or caught. There are four different areas where pressure has to be exerted on the ball. If we don't get pressure on the basketball, the offense is able to move the ball wherever it wants to go, can create all kinds of problems for our defensive play. Now, we have never held anybody scoreless, but it's important for us to start out by making it as difficult as we possibly can for the offense to move the basketball and to take it where it wants to go, ball pressure. We divide the court into two distinct sections each time we have a possession defensively. Number one uh, is the man with the basketball. We always circle the number with the ball. We refer to the side of the floor where the ball is located as the ball side. This is our pressure side. We've got to get pressure on the ball, pressure on the passing lanes. We've got to make it tough to move the basketball. Pressuring the ball gives the offensive team about as much trouble, I think, as anything that we can do defensively. The offensive team that's allowed to move the ball as it wants is going to get good shots eventually, sometimes without using too much time. But the offensive team that has to work to move the ball is going to have difficulty, obviously, in getting the shot. I tell my players this. How do you want to play on offense? Do you want to be guarded tightly? Do you want to have a problem getting a shot, or do you want to be guarded loosely and be able to move? Don't play defense as you want defense to be played against you. Play defense the way you don't want it played against you. Think of all the things you don't want done to you on defense. Think of how easy you really want it when you're on offense, and then play defensively just the opposite. Secondly, we want the, the opposite side to always be an indication that this is where our help is going to come from. So when we're talking to players, we're talking about ball side, we're talking about help side. We feel because of setting up the court into a ball side and help side, we have created a situation where our defense is going to have a five on two advantage or a five on three advantage. I don't think there is anything in offensive basketball that involves more than three people with the basketball at any one time. Most offensive situations involve only two people with the basketball in any given play sequence. Our five defensive people, however, being aware of ball position, ball location, pressuring the basketball should always be involved with the ball, which should in all cases, regardless of what defense you're playing, give the defense an advantage of five versus two or five versus three. Now the things we're going to talk about are going to be things that I feel are applicable to whatever defense you're going to play. After separating our ball side defense and our help side defense, we're going to start at the top with ball side defense and that means pressure on the basketball when it's being brought into play. To get pressure on the ball, we have to have good defensive stance. Our stance is one where we try to meet the ball at the point of pickup with the inside foot forward. My stance would be something like this with the sideline over on my right side. My feet are a little bit wider than my hips. My inside foot is going to be slightly forward at the point of pickup. As I get into my stance to meet the ball, I'm going to have my hands outside of my knees so that I can pressure the ball whichever way it goes. We try to teach our players that when the ball moves to your right, you're going to pressure the ball with your right hand. When it moves to your left, you're going to pressure the ball with your left hand. Really, the inside foot forward is a term that can be used only at the point of pickup. Because if the ball is taken to my right side toward the sideline, very quickly, I'm going to move into a position where my shoulders and my body are square to the side of the man dribbling the basketball. The same thing would be true if the ball is taken to my left. Now. I'm going to turn and drop step with my left foot so that I'm square to that man's shoulder. 
I want to make sure as the ball is being dribbled to the side that I have my head slightly in front of the basketball. I have my forward hand, in this case my left hand, where I can pressure the basketball. In the event of a spin dribble or a crossover dribble, I have my back hand, in this case my right hand, in position where I can get a little pressure on the basketball, where if it's a spin dribble, I can drop step slightly to pick up the ball as it comes back the other way. I always want to keep my head slightly ahead of the basketball when it's being dribbled. Our basic drill for stance is the zigzag drill. In the zigzag drill, we're trying to maintain pressure on the basketball, first of all, by keeping our hands behind our back. Footwork is the absolute most important thing there is in defensive play. If we don't learn to move our feet, then we can never use our hands. Our hands will never help us if we can't utilize our feet to get us in position where our hands can get the job done. Consequently, we'll work for the first week of practice with our hands behind our backs in the zigzag drill. Then we will take our hands out from behind our backs and work to get pressure on the basketball with our hands just as we're trying to move our feet to get our hands in position where they can do the job. In the zigzag drill, we start out by letting the first pair get to the foul line and the next pair starts out as you can easily see in what we're doing here. Eventually in the zigzag drill, we'll get to the point where we're actually trying to take or deflect the ball away from the offensive player. Which brings us to perhaps the most important point in teaching individual defensive play one-on-one. -on -one. My objective in a defensive stance is containment, not the steal. I've got to be very careful that I make sure I get the ball going toward the corner of the floor, that I keep the ball out of those areas where the offense has a chance of getting a high percentage shot. I can't do that by making a bad attempt to get the ball that takes me out of balance or puts me in position where I'm reaching in with the backhand and committing the foul. My hand pressure on the basketball is subtle pressure. Just enough to let the offensive man know that I'm there, that I'm in a position where if he's careless, I can get the basketball. My primary objective is not to steal. My primary objective is containment in any one-on-one -on -one defensive situation. Pressure on the basketball. The second point of emphasis for us defensively is ball position. Know where it is at all times. Never be without vision on ball location. You have to know where the ball is because this determines what you're going to do. It determines whether you're going to contest the pass, whether you're in a help out position, what your block out responsibilities are going to be, what you'll do in so far as rotation is concerned if a drive is made to the basket. It is adamantly important defensively that each of our five guys at all times knows the location of the basketball. In this regard, we're going to have, I think, always at least a five on three, and in many cases, a five on two defensive advantage, because I believe that in most offensive maneuverings, only two or at the most three people can be involved with the ball at any one time. Consequently, if we've got all five people paying attention to the basketball, knowing where the basketball is, then we have five people with attention on the ball which is the number one thing that we've got to stop. There are three things in your list of priority in defensive approach, individually as a player, and they are number one, the basketball. You've got to know where it is, and you've got to be able to stop it at all times. Number two is your position as it relates to the basketball, the basket, and the man you're guarding. And number three is the man you're guarding. I don't care whether this is man-to-man, -man, defense or whether it's zone defense that we're talking about. Our defensive stance and the principle of pushing the ball toward the corner with that stance is applicable everywhere on the defensive perimeter for us. When we move from stance, the next thing we go to is contesting the pass to the corner. This is the basic guard forward pass that initiates almost every offensive movement in basketball. As you can see here, we're trying to get our head between the man being played and the basketball. It's important that we have a stance that's going to be parallel to the path that he's going to utilize trying to get open to the ball. We have the defensive man playing the ball over his shoulder.
He's got the focal point of his vision as the basketball, and he can see the man out of the corner of his eye. I think it's essential that vision be on the basketball. We can't play the ball out of the corner of the eye because it's such a small object it moves so quickly, but I can play the man out of the corner of my eye. In contesting the pass to the corner, we're going to have the inside arm extended. We're going to have the hand turned toward the ball, trying to prevent, deflect, intercept any pass that's made. What we're trying to do is force the offense as far out on the floor as possible to handle the basketball. We're only going to open up in two circumstances. We're going to open up when the pass is made on any kind of a back cut situation, or we're going to open up when the man enters the lane. And in that particular position, we will momentarily be fronting the postman. Pressuring the basketball becomes a combination of the stance and exerting foot and hand pressure on the ball when it's being dribbled and contesting the man on the perimeter in a position to receive the pass. There is a degree of help necessary in the ball side aspect of our defense. That help comes in a move we call jumping to the basketball. You can see once the pass has been made, a penetrating pass, the man playing the passer is going to move quickly to the basketball. This enables him to do any one of three things. Number one, he's in position to help on the ball if the ball is dribbled back toward the middle of the court. Number two, he's in position to try to take away or at least hinder any move made of a pass and go behind variety that's used in so many different offensive setups. And number three, if the passer chooses to make a cut to the basket, the defensive man moving quickly away from the passer and toward the basketball is not nearly as liable to be beaten with such a move as he would be if he were staying with the passer and then trying to react to what his move would be. Anytime a penetrating pass is made on the perimeter, we want the defensive man on the passer jumping to the basketball, moving as quickly as he can into a position where he can help stop penetration by the man who has just received the pass. This also puts him in position to take away any cut that would be made by the man he's guarding toward the basket by fronting the cutter or by stepping in on a cut to go behind and get the ball back. We're going to jump to the ball quickly, recover to the shooter, jump to the ball, recover to the shooter. In this sequence, we're going to help and then recover, in position to help, and now we recover, and now we're going to jump and take the cut away. Jump to the ball, we take the cut away, and now we're going to stop him from going behind and getting the ball back. Good. All right, take it again. Jump to the ball, beat him to the spot. Okay, good. Stop. Moving to help side defense, Let's establish, first of all, our two basic help side rules for inside defensive play. First of all, with the ball above the foul line extended, all inside defensive players from the foul line extended down, which could include a guard who's gone through, a forward setting up, or a postman, all inside defensive players will be one step on the man side of the basket. Basket, midline, one step on the man side of the basket with the ball above the foul line extended. And we want his back hand extended in such a way that it will be in the passing lane to his man. If the ball goes either on the dribble or the pass below the foul line extended, that defensive man will move into position B, which is one step on the ball side of the basket still with the back hand in the passing lane, in a position now to help on the postman should the pass be made there, and to prevent his man from making a flash pivot cut toward the basketball. We also feel that by following this rule, two other things happen for us. Number one, we're difficult to screen in the bottom defensive positions. If we're out in here somewhere tight to the man, we become an easy screening target. But when we are away from the man, we're much more difficult to screen because we can go either way around the screen. We have a lot of room to work with when we follow our rules. Secondly, if a man offensively should clear from the ball side through to our help side, 
our defensive people follow these rules by stopping appropriately one step on the man side of the bucket or one step on the ball side of the bucket. This enables us to maintain the continuity of our five on two or five on three approach to defense. These two rules establishes our defense in such a way that the focus is all toward the basketball. The basic idea is stopping the basketball, and these rules enable us to do that. Whether it's stopping the basketball through help against the drive, or help against the feed into the postman, or in setting up in a better position to prevent the cut toward the ball, or to be more difficult to be screened. Our third basic point of defense, then, is wrapping up the defensive possession. Wrapping up the defensive possession simply means that everybody does a job in getting the basketball back to us, going to the offensive end of the floor once the shot has been taken or the pass has been made to the basket or the drive has been made to the basket. We've got to shut off penetration. We've got to take away the pass into the post area or we've got to block out and get the shot as it's coming off the defensive backboard. If we allow any of these three things to happen at the tail end of the offensive possession, then we're giving the opponent an excellent chance to score. And what we have done in terms of pressuring the basketball and knowing ball location is going to be wasted in that particular possession. So how many times we can wrap up the defensive possession by getting the basketball before a basket can be scored will determine how successful we're going to be defensively. With our perimeter players, we play three on three on the outside. Here, we have an opportunity to utilize all the things necessary for both ball side and help side perimeter defense. We make it very tough with our players because we use a coach as a release pass in the post, or we can have a coach on the outside as a release man if we care to do so. Here, we're just using three on three without an outside release. We don't allow any switching until we get to a point in the season where the switch becomes a part of our defense. We try to go through the first three weeks of the season with no switching whatsoever. I think if we can get our players to a point where they can stay with and communicate staying with the men that they've been assigned, then we have a much better chance of making the switch effective along with being able to play straight defense. I think the switch can become a crutch if it's used too early. Passing lane pressure, passing lane! With a two-on-two -two situation, we can put a postman in with no defensive player on it. Now we've really created a problem for our guards. They've got to pick up tough at midcourt. We've got an open postman that they can throw the ball into. Then we can make our moves off the postman. He's got plenty of time. They've got to help out on that postman, be conscious of him, and then recover. We can add an open postman to our three-on-three -three situation, and now we have a combination of help side, ball side defense, plus we've got to help out on the postman. The offense has an automatic release. Anytime they look for it, they can go into the post with the basketball, and the defense has to react accordingly. They've got to help out on the postman, pressure the ball, help on the basketball. Again, this is in keeping with our idea of giving an advantage to the offense, making it very, very difficult for the defense to do what it's got to do. We set up our flash post defensive drill with the defensive man in good position, set up in relation to the basketball. If the ball's above the foul line extended, he's one step on the man side of the bucket. If it's below the foul line extended, he's one step on the ball side of the bucket. Uve, where Joby is, you've got to be right here. You're slightly open to the ball right here. You're not here. You're right here. Slightly. If the Joby's above the foul line extended, then you're right here. On the man side of the bucket, slightly open. When he comes, you take it away from him. When he goes down below you, you open up to it. Just start below, Joby. Take it away, take it away, take it away from him. Take it away, Uve. Rotate it, rotate it, rotate it.
We set up a flash post drill with a defensive man in position, depending upon ball location. If he's below the foul line extended with the ball, the defensive man is ball side of the basket. If he's above the foul line extended, the defensive man is man side of the basket. We're going to make our move to the basketball. We want to close it out and end up with the basketball. If the man starts high on offense and goes to the bucket, we're going to open up with it. If he comes out on the other side, we're going to contest it. Come high, Uve. Come high this time. We've got to set up following our defensive rule. Step in with the head between the man and the ball. Slow down your pass a little bit, Joby. Don't knock anybody down. Taking away. Back cut. Back cut, Uve. Open up, Darrell. Open up. Come down and contest. Good, good. Rotate it. Change it. Let's go. The flash pivot is one of the things that I think creates more problems than anything else. Defensive. Ooh, they open up to the ball, son. That's it. Now you can go either way. That's it. We set up a one-on-one -on -one blockout situation that works both the defensive and offensive aspects of rebounding. We're trying to put into use our defensive blockout principles, establishing contact, maintaining that contact, and going after the ball. Either passing it as an outlet or taking it off the board on the dribble and getting it ahead toward the offensive end of the court. We can move the block out from one on one to two on two or three on three. The principles are all the same. I've been asked many times about offensive rebounding. And my answer is quite simply this. The best offensive rebounders are those that just go to the board for the ball every time the shot's taken. I just don't think there's any drill, there's anything that, that can establish a guy as an offensive rebounder other than his willingness to constantly be going after the ball. We tell our players that the tougher the guy is to keep off the board, the harder he is to keep away from the backboard, the more he goes after the ball, the better offensive rebounder he's going to be. Three on three block out right here. Three on three block out, both ends. Let's go. We build our block out up into a three on three situation where the offensive players are moving. They can screen, cut, move toward the ball. The coaches handle the basketball. We've got to get the block out in what now amounts to a, a game situation where we have both a ball side and a help side block out. The offense, if it gets the rebound, is going to try and score with it, or they're going to bring the ball back out on top to the coach, who then will handle the block out situation, either by making a pass to an offensive man who's gotten open or putting the ball up on the board. In every blockout drill that we use, every sequence, we want our players to take the ball on an outlet, either through the dribble, and there are some players that we allow to use the dribble on the outlet, and some that we don't. Let's get the outlet, get the ball out of there! If a player is one of those that we allow to dribble the ball out of there, he can do so. If it's a player that we have make the outlet pass rather than using the dribble, he's going to make the pass every time he gets the defensive rebound. My whole idea in getting the ball out of there is simply to get away from the board with the basketball. I don't want the ball thrown away in attempting to get a quick outlet from the defensive board. I'd rather get away a couple seconds slower and still have the basketball. We tell our players that the perfect rebound is when the ball hits the floor and we've blocked out everybody so well that we end up with it coming off the floor. In addition to three general points of emphasis defensively, we've identified five areas that we believe we have to cover every single day in practice. We won't cover any one of these areas in exactly the same way from day to day, but something must be done we must work on each of these five areas in some way every single night in practice. Whether it be in October or in March makes no difference. These five defensive areas for us are number one, pressure on the basketball. We feel that each day in some way in practice, we have to work in pressuring the basketball. By adding a defensive point
player to the post situation, we have the full three on three that can occur in ball side defense. We have to get pressure on the basketball, contest passes. We have to give ball side help, fight through screens. Everything that has to be done in any ball side situation is here in three on three. Again, our policy is not to do any switching until we get to a point where we think we've been able to handle things without the switch. Secondly, we have to work on pressuring the passing lanes. We have to work on making it tough for the offense to move the ball from one position to the other. We can combine the guard forward aspects of our ball side defense in a simple two on two situation where we try to get the exchange between guard and forward offensively. We work to prevent it on defense. We don't use any help side in here except the help that can be given on the ball side of what we're doing. Good, Daryl, good contest. We're trying to make it as tough as possible to get anything done on the ball side. Trying to keep the ball from being reversed then becomes our next prerogative. We've got to set up in such a way if we slide into the defensive post that we prevent the man in the post, obviously, from getting the basketball. We set up the guard forward aspect of our ball side defense in a two on two situation. Bouvet, you gotta jump to the ball. Thirdly, we must work on helping and recovering. We've talked about setting up our defense in such a way that we have a five on two advantage or a five on three advantage. Helping and recovery. You can't have one without the other. When we help, we have to recover. And I think the the basic foundation of our defense is built on the idea of stopping the basketball and to stop the basketball the way it can be maneuvered by offenses today and by individuals, we absolutely have to have help. And each day, in some way, we're going to work in practice on helping and recovering. Our help and recovery drill involves three people. A defensive man starting out on the basketball. If it's a guard forward pass, we're going to jump toward the basketball. On any penetrating pass, as we've already discussed, we want to make that quick move toward the ball. However, if it's a pass from inside back out, a forward to guard pass or a pass from the post back outside, then we are going to reestablish our contesting position, either on the perimeter player or the postman. Both sequences are shown here. In our three-man help and recover drill, we can start with a defensive man on the ball, he jumps quickly to the ball following the pass, stops penetration, and then recovers to get pressure on the shooter. All right, there's a necessity to help out on the ball side. We set up the drill accordingly. If we're putting pressure on a man down toward the baseline and the pass goes back out on top, we reassume a contesting position, and if the drive is made, we've got to come off and help, and then we recover to the ball. Two on two with an open post man. We make it much tougher on the defense now by having an open post man. The defense has to do everything that it must do in a strong side situation, and the offense now has an automatic release. They can back screen, back cut off the post man. The post man is handling the ball unhindered. The fourth thing that we have to work on each day in practice is the blockout. We talk about ending the defensive possession with the basketball, and I don't think this is possible for us to do unless we're a team that can keep the opponent off the board. The blockout is going to be worked on anywhere from one-on-one -on -one to a five-on-five -five situation. All right, four groups, one-on-one -on -one blockout. Let's go. The importance of the blockout, I think, has already been made insofar as it being one of the five things that we work on defensively each night. We set up one-on-one -on -one situations around the court with a coach or a manager putting the ball up on the board and execute the blockout. As we've shown, either the front turn or the reverse turn can be used. We want the defensive man in on the board after the ball. People have often asked me, what do you do for offensive blockout? Well, I'm really not sure. I think offensive blockout is simply determined by a guy who's always going after the ball on the board. I think every time the ball's shot, the best offensive rebounders just constantly go after. We try to work on, on pressure and on turns and spins 
to get our offensive people to the board, but I just don't think anything beats constantly going after. Our defensive people in this situation are trying to get the butt into the man, the block out, and then get the basketball and get it headed toward the offensive end of the floor. The fifth thing that we have to emphasize and work on each day in practice is post defense. I don't just expect our post people to be able to play defense in the post, but I think everybody on our squad has got to be able to play defense in the post. When we get down into a low post position or a semi-low post position, we can almost always stay on the high side of the postman even though we're forcing the ball toward the corner. You must visualize that we're going to have help coming in from behind. Now occasionally we will be in a situation where it is necessary for us to stay behind the postman. We're going to stay behind the postman so that if the pass does come in to him, our help will come from not the opposite side of the ball, but from the ball side. We would do this against a postman who is bigger or stronger than we are or who is an outstanding score. One that we can't get on the side of simply because if the ball is reversed, he's going to be able to quickly go to the other side of the key and the pass can be punched into him from that side. Post defense is really the heart of defensive play. We feel that if we can take away or at least to a great extent hinder the effectiveness of the offensive postman, then we're forcing the offense to move away from the basket, and this is essentially what we're trying to do in everything that we do defensively, particularly on the ball side of our defense. Our defensive post drills are drills that we try to incorporate uh, an advantage given to the offensive man. We want to make it as tough as possible, as in this two ball defensive post drill, where the postman offensively is moving from side to side looking to get the pass from the manager on either side of the court. The defensive man has got to beat him to the spot both sides. You two managers, I don't want you to be great ball handers. You catch it and you throw it right in. You're not trying to throw it around the defensive man. All I want is for him to beat the guy to the spot. Using two basketballs is a very effective way of giving an advantage to the offense. And when we give an advantage to the offense, we're forcing the defense to work harder in a practice situation than it will have to work in a game situation, which I think is essential to building good defensive play. If you don't make your practice more difficult than the game situation, your players are not going to be able to handle the game situation. There has to be a degree of difficulty in practice in however you establish it that allows a player to get into a game situation with the confidence that he can handle the game play with the knowledge that he's had to work at a more difficult situation in practice than he has in the game. We can also utilize three feeders in our post-defensive play with an offensive man, a defensive man, one basketball. However, the advantage to the offense is simply this. We can now make the feed into the postman from any one of the three spots and the defensive man has got to work to cover it. In everything that we do from a practice standpoint, we're going to try and keep the ball out of the post. In a game situation, as I indicated a moment ago, we may make some adjustments and perhaps move behind the postman rather than trying to keep him from getting the basketball. But when we do move behind the postman, any time that we should set ourselves up in a defensive position where we are going to be behind the postman, our primary objective then is to keep the postman off the board, number one, and number two, to make it difficult, if not impossible, for him to go from one side to the other. We obtain no advantage in post play if by playing behind the postman, we still allow him to come over top of us and establish position on the other side. Playing behind the postman enables us to prevent this from happening. Just as we have three general points of emphasis in defensive play, we have four general points of emphasis in offensive play. We feel that if we can accomplish these four things, then we're going to have a pretty good offense. Just as if we can accomplish our three defensive ideas, 
regardless of what our defense is, man-to-man -man zone, what difference does it make, we're going to be pretty good defensively. I don't care whether you run patterns, the passing game, motion offense, any combination. If you can do these four things, you're going to be pretty good offensively. Number one is shot selection. You've got to teach your players shot selection, and it's different for every player. And every player has got to know what his limitations and his strengths as a shooter are. I think knowing strengths and weaknesses, both offensively and defensively, is extremely important in the development of an individual player. And each player has got to know not only his strengths and weaknesses, but those of everybody else on the basketball team. Shot selection is my version of shot selection. I think you've got to be very careful about this. The kids are going to have different ideas on shot selection than you as a coach have. If a team is going to take the effort, make the effort, to get shots, then let's make damn sure we're getting good shots. Shot selection, absolute number one in importance in offensive development. All right, there are three things that we really pay attention to in shooting. The first of all is leg lift. We want strong leg lift with our shooters. We want them to get their legs into the shot because we think everything begins with the legs. The second thing we want with our shooters is full extension of the shooting arm and the hand following through in such a way as to have this finger spread as though we're trying to put the hand in the basket right after the basketball. The third thing we constantly check with our shooter is that the eye remains fixed to the basket. We don't want the shooter following the flight of the ball after he has released it. Now, there are a lot of things that you can do with the technique of shooting. I just want to go through those three points before we show some things that we do with our players in terms of setting up the kind of shot situation that they're going to have in practice. The drill that we like players to use when they don't have anybody to throw them the ball or they don't have anybody to play defense is just put a ball in a chair and make cuts off the chair, picking up the ball, taking the shot. He can either step into the chair and get the shot or he can pick the ball up off the chair make a fake and put it on the floor with a dribble, taking himself further away from the defensive player. We like our players to set a goal for themselves anytime they're shooting. We want them to shoot in sets of 10 and have in mind that they're going to hit 6 out of 10 or they're going to hit 7 out of 10 before they go on to another shot or to another area of the floor. Number two is handling the ball without making mistakes. And we've got to work at developing our players in such a way that we can catch it, we can pass it, we can move it on the dribble to get it into position where we can utilize good shot selection. I don't think there's anything that helps more in the development of hand and forearm strength than just simply using the basketball in this fashion. Every night of the season before we start practice, we have our players handling the ball this way. Really going with the ball 25 times into the left hand, 25 times into the right hand. We start every one of our practices with four corner passing drill. Moving three balls in the same direction, a three way exchange, pass, return, hand off. The players change the drill, moving the ball to the right, then everybody changing, passing the three balls to the left. Communication is something that we try to develop here with the players calling out each other's name as they make the passes. Three lanes! Three lanes is a drill that gets us moving up and down the floor to start practice. Again, we're working on communication, having the players call out each other's names. We're sprinting to fill the lanes to simulate what our break situation is all about. We usually just make two trips with each player. We want our ball handling people in the middle handling the ball. The middleman in our break always goes to the side of the lane, as you can see here as we return the ball back down the floor. If you're going to be a good ball handling team, if you're going to be a team that handles the ball without making mistakes, I think you've got to spend a lot of time at the two most fundamental aspects of the ball handling game. One is passing and two is catching. And more mistakes are made in these two things than in any other two things in the entire game of basketball. In a simple keep away drill with the two ball handlers about 12 to 14 feet apart and a defensive man in the middle, 
we get an awfully good chance to make pass fakes, to make the pass. The defensive man is using his hands to get into the ball. He's changing from one position to another. If the man makes a mistake with the ball, then he's got to go in the middle. I think we get a value both ends of the court from this drill. And I think in any drill that you're putting together, it's extremely important that you go at it in such a way that you get something out of it defensively and something out of it offensively. We've tried to take the old machine gun passing drill and set it up in such a way that the man handling the basketball does not throw to the person beside the man who has just thrown him the ball. Every 15 seconds, we change the ball, and the players all rotate in a predetermined direction. I'd call out this drill by saying, two ball passing, everybody rotate right. One of our coaches is going to call out change, and we're going to go right on to the next guy. The passing is, as you can see, random. It's not just up and down the line. We're making it difficult for the man in the middle to handle the ball because he's got to go to different spots. The guy in the middle has also got to call out the name of everybody to whom he's passing. The outside people are also calling out the name of the man in the middle. Again, we're simply trying to improve our communication by requiring the players to call names out as they pass the ball. Move the ball, move the ball, let's go! We want the players on either end of the drill to be one step behind the man in the middle, to widen his vision as much as we possibly can. And the third thing then, playing without the basketball, is a further means of getting the ball in a position to get good shots or to take advantage of our knowledge of shot selection. We've got to be able to cut, we've got to be able to screen, we've got to be able to put cuts and screens together in such a way that they enable us to get the ball into position to take good shots. And we can use our fourth point to help us in doing this. Our fourth point is helping each other get open. We help each other get open in two basic ways. Number one, by moving the basketball, either on the dribble or a pass, to a different location on the floor. Seeing what's going on is very important. I catch the ball and face the basket for a two count, 1,001, 1,002, and this just gives me enough time to see what's going on out there. And as soon as I recognize what's developing, I move the basketball accordingly. Secondly, I can screen either a back screen, a down screen, or a cross screen to help a teammate get open. Without any defensive players, we'll set up the basic V cut in our offense, which our shooter will execute before taking the shot. The screener is going to come down, set a down screen, and we're going to feed the shooter coming into position to take the shot without using the dribble. OK. We make the cut, come off the screen, go up and take the shot. Again, we're going to shoot this in sets of five. And we'll change the position from screener to cutter. Set up a good V cut now. We'll have him move to different sides of the court, set it up at different positions on the floor. But now we're putting the screen to cut and the shot all together in one. We have a back screen set up when the bottom man is considerably inside the top man as we have in this setup. When the ball is reversed, we're going to step out and screen from the bottom rather than coming down and screening from the top. Again, the man setting the screen is going to be the man closest to the middle of the court. We want the cutter to read which way he's going. The screener has also got to read the defense, and in case of both defensive players going with the cutter, then the screener can step right back and look for the shot. Four general points of emphasis offensively. Shot selection, handling the ball without mistakes, movement without the basketball, and helping each other get open. If we can develop well in these four areas, our offense is going to be effective. We've identified five specific points of emphasis that we want to cover each day in practice from a defensive standpoint. We also have identified five specific points that we want to cover every single day in practice from an offensive standpoint. 
And just as we want to do defensively, we want to cover our offensive points in October practices and March practices as well. The first thing that we're going to do from an offensive standpoint each day in practice is handle the basketball. We've got to work at handling the ball in such a way that we don't make mistakes with it. If we're going to make mistakes handling the basketball, we aren't ever going to get it in position to score. We have a pre-practice routine for our players. We want them to do three things before we ever get them involved in anything of a practice nature. First of all, we want them coming out and skipping rope for 60 seconds. They'll skip with both feet, forward, backward, on one foot, then the other. They'll alternate feet uh, as well as skipping with both feet at the same time. They'll go with the rope both forward and backward. We feel that there isn't anything that's better for our agility and flexibility than rope jumping. So we start each practice with this for 60 seconds. The next thing we want our players to do in a pre-practice situation is handle the basketball as hard as they can from one hand to the other. Really going with the ball 25 times into the left hand, 25 times into the right hand. I don't think there's anything that helps more in the development of hand and forearm strength than just simply using the basketball in this fashion. Every night of the season before we start practice, we have our players handling the ball this way. The third thing we do in our pre-practice routine is handle the basketball, trying to become as familiar with the ball as possible. You can see the players each have their own routine. They use figure eights or round the legs. They can dribble the basketball uh, in place or move around the court with it. I think that when we talk about handling the ball without mistakes, one of the important things in doing this is familiarity with the basketball. This little 60 second routine that each player goes through prior to stepping on the floor for the actual start of practice helps us in the development of that familiarity with the basketball. I think it's really important that any time you're involved in starting out a practice session, you do something with a really quick, snappy ball handling drill. We call this our four corners drill. We're trying to get as much quickness and communication in this drill as we possibly can. You can see that we use three basketballs with a, a pass, follow up, and return. The players are calling out change to one another, so they change direction. We immediately want all three balls going in the opposite direction. Our three lane sequence is just a drill to use early in the practice session to get people running up and down the floor. We think it helps with communication again because every player has got to call out the name of the man he's passing the ball to. We've talked about communication and I can't begin to emphasize how absolutely important players talking to one another is. We want our offensive men to constantly change positions because that's part of our offensive play. Also, it makes our defensive men get a different look at it every time that they set up in any possession. We gotta catch it, we gotta catch it, boys. Hey, you Reds have just had two possessions. He loses the ball because he can't hold it. You lose it because you can't catch it. That's how simple this game is. If you can hold it and catch it, you can play. The second thing we've got to work on each day is movement, screening and cutting. Screening and cutting are a vital part of our man-to-man -man offense. We don't screen a great deal against the zone, but we do a lot of cutting and moving against the zone and obviously against all kinds of full court press situations. So in each practice, screening and cutting is a specific point of emphasis that we must in some way cover. All right, cross screen. Take the ball on top, Jimmy, one way or the other. In our cross screen situation, we start with the ball at the top of the key and take it either way. The offensive player on the side the ball is taken to automatically becomes a screener going across the lane, setting the screen for his teammate to come toward the ball. The movement that we try to utilize in setting the, the cross screen has three counts to it. We want the screener to one, turn, two, look, and three, set the screen. We can turn this situation into a back screen or a down screen situation either way depending upon what happens with the defensive players as they make their moves to cover the cross screen initially.
Good. Get set, Danny, get set. We play each day without the dribble. Only the man crossing the midcourt can use the dribble. We have to rely on screening and cutting and passing to get shots. I think we have to put this kind of a burden on our offensive play each day to develop the kind of movement and the kind of awareness that we have to have when playing without the basketball. Taking the dribble away from the offense is something that I think really helps us in the development of our cutting and screening. Thirdly, each day in practice, we're going to work on shooting. We're going to work on shooting under pressure. I think the biggest waste of time in any practice situation is free shooting. Letting a guy come out, dribble the ball, shoot it, rebound it, shoot it again is just the biggest waste that I've ever seen in a basketball practice. We at no time allow our players to do any free shooting. Shooting work is controlled, it's competitive, there is pressure involved in it of one form or another. We try to set up shooting situations as competitively as we possibly can. A great shooting situation is to time a shooter for 20 seconds or 30 seconds and see if he can reach a specific goal. In this drill, we're going to see if our shooter can hit five shots in 20 seconds, jump shots from the free throw line, getting his own rebound and coming back to take the shot. Ready? Start. You'll notice that he's passing the ball back to himself to as closely as possible simulate a situation where he would be moving without the basketball to a point where he is going to get the ball and either shoot off a screen or put the ball on the floor and take the shot. Stop. I think any time that you're working in a competitive shooting situation, you're doing far more for the shooter than allowing him to shoot on his own. The next shooting drill involves three spots on the floor with a shooter in each spot. The shooter has to make whatever you as a coach designate, one shot, three shots, five shots, whatever, from his spot before he can move on to the next spot. The first shooter to get back to his original starting spot will win the drill. We're going to use three spots in this demonstration. Ready? Start. Everything still applies. They're going to be making passes back to themselves. In this drill, we're just going to have the boys make one shot before they can move on. I would set this drill up very quickly by saying, three guys at a basket, spot shooting, make one shot and rotate clockwise or counterclockwise or rotate to your right or rotate to your left. They're competing obviously against one another. They also have the confusion of three balls being shot. They've got to concentrate through that confusion both on the target and on the mechanics of what they're doing. All right, Todd's back at his original spot. We can increase the three spot drill to four spots or to five spots as we have here. The drill is exactly the same. I've told the players that we're going to make one shot from each spot before moving on to the next spot, rotating right or counterclockwise. Ready, start. As you can see, five balls brings about a tremendous amount of confusion. They've got to go after balls. They've got to pay attention to somebody else shooting. They've got to pay attention to what they're doing. I think this is something that really helps us with improvements in our concentration on shooting. This is where we get away from the idea of free shooting, where anything goes, where you don't have to concentrate on anybody taking a shot. Competition is involved. Each guy wants to see if he can win the particular drill. We can go anywhere from one shot and rotate up to making five shots from a spot and rotate. Stop. The next shooting drill involves two people on a basketball. This is a drill that we throw in at various times during the course of any practice. I'll just call out, pair up, shoot to 10. Immediately the players grab partners, they get to the nearest basket, and we're going to shoot to 10. For the sake of demonstration, we'll only go to four. Ready? Start. Player takes the shot, gets his own rebound, throws it back to his partner. Again, there's an amount of concentration and discipline involved relative to chasing the ball down, getting the pass back to the guy so he can step right up and take the shot. Trying to develop quickness is extremely important to us 
in this drill as is the case with any of our shooting drills because we've got to develop players who not only can get the ball in the hole but can do it under pressure and can do it as quickly as possible. The pressures of game play have got to be a part of every shooting drill that we use. Stop. Anytime we're on the floor working on shooting without setting up something specifically, our players are working against a partner with defensive pressure being applied moderately. We never allow them to come out and just take the ball and shoot it. They've got to go against some kind of defensive pressure. In this kind of a situation, we'll take five shots and then change with the defense going to offense and vice versa. Again, to re-emphasize the point, I just don't think anything wastes more time than allowing players to shoot on their own without some form of pressure. Stop. The fourth thing that we're going to work on every day in practice is the fake, the pass fake and the shot fake. We think that our two biggest weapons against the zone are the pass and the shot fake. The pass fake enables me to get the zone to move maybe a step away from the direction I'm going to come back in and so far as moving the ball is concerned. The shot fake enables me to get the zone up a little bit higher so I can get past it. The shot fake is also something that's of primary importance to us in coming off a screen and in utilizing movement with the basketball once we have gotten it in a position where we can do something with it. Pass fake, shot fake, every day in practice. The pass fake is a very important part of what we do offensively. We like to set up a keep away drill every night in practice where our players are working on pass fakes and the delivery of the ball past the defensive man. By the same token, we're forcing the defensive man to pressure the basketball. If the defensive man can get to a three count before the pass is made, then the man with the ball becomes a middleman. Good fakes, good fakes, good pass fakes. We've talked about how important the shot fake is to our overall offense, both against the man-to-man -man and zone defenses. Here we're going to demonstrate the shot fake. The defensive player has the ball, makes the pass out to his partner who's going to execute the shot fake. Go ahead. Go around the defensive player for the shot. All right, let's go, let's go quicker, let's go quicker. All right, we're going to work going both ways for the shot. We'll take five shots under moderate pressure and then change with the shooter becoming the defensive player and the defensive man becoming the shooter. The shot fake, as we said, is something that we've got to work on every night because it's such a big part of our offense against both man-to-man -man and zone defenses. We do this in pairs with everybody participating. Stop. And the fifth thing that we're going to work on each day in practice is our attack against zone defense. It may be the fundamental approach to the way we handle all zones in general or it may in a practice situation be our attack against a specific zone. We're going to work one on two Royce. Take the ball into the gap and make the pass off to the manager. Same thing here. Take the ball into the gaps, make the passes off to the managers. All right. Get them set up so we got two working against three Joby. Two against three to start with and two feeders out on top. Let's go. In our perimeter zone work, we set up a ball handler against two people in the top of a zone. We want to work at using the dribble to take it into the gaps of the zone and then making the pass to either side. This gap doesn't just represent a two-man front zone. This can be a gap anywhere in the zone. We can set up the two defensive players any place on the floor to represent the gap. All right, rotate it. Let's go. Take it three times and change it. Let's go. Dribbling the ball into the gaps of the zone is something that's extremely important for us in our zone attack, regardless of what the zone is. We've got to be able to bring both people to the ball or two people to the ball. We've got to be able to bring two people to the ball, get rid of the ball, and then set up a two-on-one situation somewhere else on the court that's in our favor. 
We want everybody on our squad to be able to work at dribbling the gaps. Everybody that's going to be on the perimeter against the zone has got to be able to take the ball into the gaps of the zone, make the pass out of the gap to help us set up that two-on-one situation that's going to be in our favor someplace else on the court. All right, two against three, Jimmy, two against three. Spread it out, spread it out. So you got a three-man front. Wider, Tracy, wider. Get back, Chuck, top of the key. All right, let's go. We'll go from one man dribbling against a two-man gap to two players working against three people. Now we've set up two gaps that we want to go into. We're trying to get our offensive people to penetrate those gaps. Split the, hold it, hold it. Go all the way through the gap if you can. Take the ball right to the bucket. You're trying to get through those gaps. You're not just trying to get into them. You're trying to get through the gap all the way to the bucket. Let's go. Look for the step up shot. Come on, defense. You've got to shut him off. Hold it, hold it, hold it. Steve, the ball has to come to the middle of the court before you can bring it back where you got it from. Anytime you're playing the side of his own offense and the ball comes back to you, it's got to touch the middle of the floor before you can bring it back to that same side. That's it, that's it. Get it reversed, get it reversed, good. Anytime we can work with two people against the gaps in the zone, we're going to look to get the step up shot if it's available to us. But our primary purpose is utilizing the dribble to get into the gaps, bringing two people to the basketball. Keep the zone spread now, keep it spread. Go to the outside, Winston, go to the outside. Take him to the outside, now back in. Now in, that's it, mix it up a little bit. We can change spots on the zone, going inside the zone to the foul line and then coming back out on top. Just as we try to do with everything, both offensively and defensively that we do, we break our zone offense down into parts and then put these together in the hole or the five on five situation. All right, hold it. Marty, come down here now. Marty, come down here. Three against four. We set up three gaps with a four-man zone, putting three offensive players working against it, taking the ball into the gaps or working with the cross-court pass. The pass fake and the shot fake both have to be a part of our zone attack in any situation when we're working against the zone. Back on top. Let's go. Let's go. Get wider, Danny. Stay wider so we can make the pass. We work three on four with a box set up against our three-man offense. Now we have three gaps to attack. Our pass fakes, our shot fakes are all very important to us. We can change position. We want to again get into the gaps of the zone to make it difficult for the zone to cover five people. If we bring two people into a gap, just as is the case in any other situation we set up, then we've got to have a two-on-one in our favor someplace. The dribble, as we've discussed, is one of our primary weapons against the zone. We think we can do a lot more with the dribble against the zone in terms of gap penetration. We've set up with three offensive players against a four-man zone. This gives us three gaps. We're looking to take the ball into those gaps. We want three people to be able to contain four. Usually we talk about containment from a defensive standpoint, but when we're attacking a zone, we want our perimeter people to be able to contain the offensive people through the use of the dribble.
Good, Tracy. Three people attacking four in the zone. Gives us three gaps to work against. We're still working on our pass fakes, our shot fakes. We're working on taking the ball into the gaps, forcing two defensive men to cover the same offensive man. This, as we've said, gives us a great opportunity for a two-on-one situation in our favor somewhere else. Along with the shot fake, we spend a great deal of time working on the step-up shot against zone defense. In this situation, one of our coaches, Jimmy Cruz, will bring the ball into play against an imaginary zone, and our shooter is going to step up into the gap, receive the pass, and get into the shot right away. You'll notice that we want him stepping into the shot as he catches the ball to get it away as quickly as possible. We think this is one of the essential ingredients that we've got to have in order to attack a zone on the perimeter. We're looking to take the shot from the 16 to 18 foot area. That white arc that you see on the court is at 16 feet from the basket, which is where we operate a lot of the time in reversing the ball against the zone defense. Step into the shot, work on it from both sides of the floor. We work on it against zone defense in general and against specific spots where we think the shot will come from against certain zones. Okay. We want to work with our inside people against the zone, setting up two, working against three. So we get high-low situations. We get the kind of movement that we're going to have to get against the inside of the zone. We want them communicating with one another, talking. We want them coming up into the middle of the zone from behind. We want them working to be able to read each other, to stay out of each other's way, looking to come high, low, past each other. Look for the shot, Todd. Look for the shot. Hey, Todd, don't take a good shot and turn it into a bad play. That's the worst thing you can do on offense. It's a way to talk, Uwe. Don't expose the ball. Don't expose the ball. We think that we've got to be able to break down everything we do to be successful in whatever it is we're trying to do. This is simply the inside aspect of our zone offense. All right, three against two, three against two, three offense against two defense. Todd Nuve, take the defense. All right, let's go, let's go. Spread it out, spread it out on the baseline. Know where he is, Mike. Know where he is. Make a move, Marty. You've got to move to the ball. Spread it out. No, 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 no. Stay deep, Daryl. Stay deep on. Hey, I want you three guys to work against these two, Daryl. If you come up high, there's three more defensive players up here. The whole idea is to make two guys cover three. We'll set up two defensive players with three offensive players working against them. This is very similar to what the back line of a 3-2 zone would be or a 1-2-2 zone. We want to put as much pressure as we can on the defense. We like to use three people against any zone that has two in its back line, be it a 3-2 or a 1-2-2. We set this up as a, as a breakdown to work against zone offense with. Take it again, take it again, let's go. Three against two gives us the right kind of breakdown that we want when working against either a 3-2 zone or a 1-2-2 zone. We want to spread the bottom line. We want to force those two people on the bottom to have to guard three. If our two guys on top can keep their three guys occupied, then somewhere here on the baseline, we have a two-on-one situation in our favor. We want to be constantly moving in and out of the post, setting up what we have to do uh, to get our open jump shot from the baseline to cut in the lane, move off of it, step out, that's it. Look for the shot, very good. Okay. 
As an inside defensive drill, we want to work three offensive players against two defensive players, staying deep on the baseline, trying to take advantage of our two men on top, being able to contain three defensive players on top. We have a two-on-one situation inside that's going to be created because of our perimeter containment on top. We want our people reading each other, moving inside and out, getting a shot on the baseline or moving to get the ball in the middle against the two-man bottom part of a zone. All right, three against four, three against four. Winston, come down here. Set up a box, set up a box. Get up on top. Now we have our inside people working against the box. We have three people cutting and moving, working against the box, looking to get the ball inside, or bringing the bottom man up to take the shot on the baseline. Let him make the passes on top. Let's go. Read the lane, Mike, read the lane. Stay up above the foul line, Winston and Todd. Hold it, hold it. You, you can't drop back like that. In a ball game, you got guys who are gonna be shooting the ball from there. All right, let's go. We're looking to cut with our three bottom men against the box where we can flash in the middle, we can look to go to the middle or the baseline. We're going to work at replacing one another, taking the ball into the middle, punching it down on the baseline for the shot. Stay wide, Darrell, stay wide. We want to maintain good spacing here so that we don't get two people caught in the same spot that we're cutting in and replacing one another. Drop the ball off, Mike. You got Darrell cutting the bucket, drop the ball off. That's the way to look, very good. Get it to the bucket, Marty, get it to the bucket. Marty, why come under the bucket? Why not just hold your position right here? What the hell are you gonna do back here? Mike can't go to the bucket, you're in his way. Just stay there. And if you'll just have patience, they'll get the ball to you. Look across, look across. Now come up, now come up, Marty. Go underneath, go underneath, go underneath, Marty. Up and down, up and down. They won't get the bounce pass with a pass fake. In our fundamental work against the zone, We'll set up a 2-3 two, three with three perimeter men, working to take the ball into the gaps to move the ball from side to side with an inside man working the back part. We feel that if we can get four people working successfully against the zone, when we add the fifth to it, it just helps us that much by being able already to utilize four to get the shot against five. This is a very fundamental approach to our attacking the zone. We're not a team that uses a lot of patterns and a lot of movements against the zone. We have specific ideas that we've already discussed, such as dribble penetration, moving the ball into the gaps of the zone, stepping into open spots of the zone, with four people working against the zone and a man moving inside. We're doing a lot of those things that we're going to be doing against any kind of a zone. Working four against five is a fundamental approach we have in our zone work. We can work on our dribble penetration, our ball movement, our inside play, giving an advantage to the defense, taking one person away from the offense and still working to get a good shot, we think creates a very favorable situation for us when we do five on five work. We're trying to get our offense to develop an ability to handle the ball and do those things that we utilize against the zone 
with a four on five approach that is going to be tougher for them, uh, obviously, than using a five on five situation would be. Setting up with four offensive players against the zone and using those things that we try to do against the zone, we think is a big help to us in the development of our zone offense. We put a, the offense at a, at a disadvantage and then make them work to get the shot, develops the kind of confidence that we want when we go to a five on five situation. We set up with four offensive players against the zone, in this case a 2-3 zone, looking to penetrate the gaps, to move the ball, stepping into the open spots, getting the shot with the shot fake, the pass fake, and the movement of four people as opposed to five people that we'll be obviously using in game situations. We think this develops the kind of confidence that we need in working against the zone. If our players feel that they can get good shots with four people working against the zone, then that fifth person is just going to be a little icing on the cake for us when we set up our regular zone offensive approaches. We have a drill that not only involves stance, but involves communication. We call this the slide drill, and we can end practice with it. You can see the players sliding, talking to each other, trying to avoid bumping into one another. We go through this for three times, and at the end of each time, you can see we do a few push-ups. We come right back into it. We let the captain of our squad lead the team through the slide drill. It's a very good way to end a practice session, and it also incorporates the ideas of not only stance, but communication. And in every single thing you're doing, whether it be defensively or offensively, try to work communication into what you're doing. Try to get your players to talk to each other. Try to get them to talk to one another defensively. Try to get them to talk to one another offensively. So many times we think about patterns and plays and defenses, we forget about something like communication. And instead of teaching patterns, let's teach kids to talk, and I think it's going to be much more beneficial to us. If we can work on our five defensive points, our five offensive points each day in practice, then we're developing in those areas, we're building those things that are going to be most conducive to our being a good basketball team. And that's what this tape is all about. Working in those areas that are important to you, that are important to me, to all of us as a coach, regardless of what our individual preferences in terms of specific offenses and specific defenses might be.